So here is the third lesson in our particle physics um, series. Do look at lessons one and two uh, before this if you haven't done already, because then it will put our third lesson on interactions in more context. So what we're going to do here is we're going to cover four force, um, the forces of nature, and then how we predict whether reactions take place or not. Let's note down the, um, the four forces of nature that we, uh, some that we know already, and then I'll introduce new ones. The first one is gravity. This you would have been, you would have um, thought about or been taught much earlier on GCSE, and it deals with how mass attracts to one another. Attracts to one another. That's all objects that have mass attract, not repel, attract. It's, um, it's pretty much insignificant at a subatomic level. And so therefore, we're going to leave this one out. But nonetheless, just to give you the full picture, this one exists. Number two, however, is electromagnetic. Now this one you um, are pretty much aware of in sense of electric fields and the magnetic fields. And we'll come on to those in much more detail later, but electromagnetic interactions are anything to do with either charges or magnetic fields coming together. And you're probably familiar with the concept of like charges repel and opposites attract. And it's not that different from magnetic fields, though we're really interested in this first one. But let's do the um, magnetic fields. You know that like poles repel, opposites attract. Just to try and, you might not have learnt it like that, but just to try and draw some sort of parallel between these two areas. So furthermore, we, these deal with our, let's deal with this macroscopic level. Just turn that around. Macro meaning very large. And, um, <clears throat> and the two that we're aware of. Now, the next two that we're looking at, we'll be looking at the micro or the subatomic level. But the way I'm going to introduce that is we're going to look at the electromagnetic force of a nuclei, a nucleus, sorry. So here we go, here is our nucleus. I'm gonna make it carbon 14. You're familiar with this notation. This means that we have six protons, which defines this um, element being carbon, and 14 protons and neutrons, which gives us eight neutrons. So let's draw those in. Let's have my one, two, three, four, five, six protons, and then my neutrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll just put a plus in with the protons. Excellent. Now, based on our knowledge of electromagnetic theory and that like charges repel, this must mean that we're going to notice a force acting, repelling this nuclei because we've got lots of positive particles or pushing themselves away from positive particles. And so therefore, this nuclei would not be stable. If there weren't, <clears throat> our next force that we're looking at, which is called the strong nuclear force, often referred to as the strong force, <clears throat> And what the strong force does is it is an attractive force that is short range and it acts 
on nuclei. And what do I mean by nuclei? I mean both protons and neutrons. So there would be a strong nuclear force working between these and these and those and multiply that up all of these together. So therefore in effect we can say that there is this those two forces, if this is the strong nuclear force and this one is the electromagnetic force, balance out and therefore leave us with a stable nuclei. Good, there's another way in which we can make this stable and I'll just move on to this side. <clears throat> um, nuclear stability. can also come about by separating the protons. If you move the protons apart, then they won't experience so much electromagnetic force and therefore you're building more stability. And this occurs naturally with, um, with ever increasing nuclei. So let's just look at carbon-12 is a stable um, nuclei. We then have iron. If I just remind myself what iron is, iron is 26, 56. And then moving on again to gold, we have 79 protons and we have 197 nucleons. So I'm sure you can do the quick maths in your head here, but that leaves us with <clears throat> the number of neutrons as being six, that's the difference between the two, 30, and in here we have 118 neutrons. So you can see a much greater proportion of neutrons to protons as the atom gets larger. Whereas initially, when it's a similar size, you get a similar ratio. But starting to deviate, more neutrons, and then laterally, much more neutrons to improve nuclear stability. Now, with that in mind, there is another way of being able to make heavy nuclear nuclei more stable. So let's talk about heavy nuclei. These particles might be as we call neutron rich. And if they're neutron rich, that in itself leads to instability. So what you want to do is reduce the number of neutrons. Let's take, for example, and I'm not even sure if this works, but let's just suggest a heavy nuclei of um, thorium-90 and 234. Now let's imagine that that's, that's, let's say that's fairly stable, but if it weren't stable, it could choose to produce a, an element which would be, let's just work this out, if we have a beta decay, oops, sorry, move that different colored pen, if we had a beta decay here, that's minus one and zero, so therefore I produce 91, two, three, four, and I know noted one is protactinium. So this technique is how unstable nuclei become more stable if they are particularly neutron rich. Now the only reason I bring this up is because this interaction is what takes place in uh, carbon-14 which is radioactive and neutron rich. You can see the difference here between 6 and 6. Here I have 6 and 8. Um, and that's what takes place here. So let me just draw what's going on, which you should be familiar with anyway, because this is not that different from our other nuclear reactions that we've done at GCSE in that. 
carbon-14, beta decays. And the beta decay produces nitrogen. The only thing I really needed to appreciate was that 7 is nitrogen, but the rest comes about from this equation, so it's easy to do. What's happening lower down? Well, we know that a neutron is becoming a fast-moving electron and producing an extra proton. This bit whisks away as beta, but the proton is retained, and because we have an increase in proton number, by one, by one, this changes its, its um, nature. So it goes from carbon to nitrogen. Okay, we're going to work a bit further. What's happening at the subatomic level? Well, you know that the neutron is an up, down, down quark. You know the electron is just a lepton, something separate, and a proton is an up, up, down quark. So in effect, what's happening is one of the down quarks is becoming an electron plus an up quark. We've got what's called here a change in flavor of quarks. It's going from a down to an up. And what I should be adding here, of course, in all of these instances, is a neutrino production, an anti-neutrino production. <clears throat> Let's just write that down, anti-neutrino plus an anti-neutrino. Now, what enables this to occur? Well, we don't need to know Feynman diagrams, okay? You do not need to know them. But the great man made a really good way of seeing what's taking place um, at a subatomic level. Okay, let me just draw this reaction again, but slightly differently. Let's think about the reaction going up. I start with my neutron. Up, down, down. And then I'm going to turn into my proton, which is an up. My electron and my anti-neutrino. Okay, so you can see here that these particles continue happily to be the same, as we talked about, but this one has a change in flavour. And what takes place, because it changes in flavour, is a W particle exists virtually, you never see it, briefly. And the W particle indicates the weak force. And then that weak force then decays into an electron and a neutrino. Now what's really useful about these types of diagrams is that we know that the D and the U, the down quark and the up quark, have very different properties with them. If I write them in a different um, colour, we know that the down quark is a minus a third charge. The up quark has a two thirds charge, amongst other things. So suddenly what's happened is we've moved along this vertice and suddenly a whole negative charge has been removed, therefore leaving us with a positive two thirds charge. So this is wonderfully a negative weak charge and that leaves us with the electron being negative and the neutrino being um, uncharged. And so that perfectly fits together. That's a wonderful diagram that explains the entire reaction that takes place. Bear in mind, you don't need to know Feynman diagram, so don't freak out about that. Just appreciate what's going on here. But nonetheless, what that leads us to um, get an understanding for is, so let's write that in black so we keep it in line with everything else, is the weak force. And the weak force, which completes our subatomic forces mediates 
nuclear decay in effect. Oops, again, wrong color. And one that takes place very naturally through beta decay. So therefore, what I ought to really do at this stage is just pull together a table of um, a table showing the differences between gravity, electromagnetic, strong, weak. So you have an overall feeling of what's going on. Um, I'm going to draw it up here in red. So let's look at the interaction first. The effect. the range, and any other comment. Wonderful. So, see if we can get a decent box around these, um, around these ideas. Let's look at the first one. Let's go for gravity. the effect. It's on all matter. But remember, at the subatomic level, the matter is so small and so light that it's negligible. The range is infinite. And that's the comment. Negligible. The subatomic. At the subatomic level. Okay, the next one. Electro magnetic <clears throat> this happen takes place on all charged particles important again infinite and this affects interactions of neutral hadrons. And that's because quarks are charged. Good, next one, strong force. It takes place or affects all quarks. But the range is very small. And so therefore, that's how a nuclei can remain stable, because it only interacts with its neighbouring nuclei rather than all nuclei. And in terms of the comment here, it's similar to the one above. That being, um, it affects neutral hadrons as well. As quarks are charged. Okay, and then find out brings us on to the weak force. And let me write that slightly better. And this affects all particles, but it's even smaller the range, 10 to the minus 18. And it's only significant when no strong or EM force is present. So what I hope to do now is talk about whether or not reactions take place, nuclear reactions. And in order to do that, we need to look carefully at something called conservation laws. Now, as with energy and momentum, those ideas need to be conserved in physics. And at a subatomic level, we also need to conserve the following. One of those uh, properties is charge. Um, often given the symbol Q, so you'll see if I write Q, I'll be working out whether the charge is conserved. I mean, this is just straightforward. I don't need to explain this too much. It's whether 
positive and negative charges are balanced on either side of an equation. So I'll show you more through an example rather than try to explain that too much. The next idea is something called lepton number. And this L is, um, well, let me describe what types of particles have what types of lepton numbers. So L particle, let's look at an electron first, which you know is a lepton. Um, we'll also look at a positron. We'll look at a neutrino. And we'll look at an anti-neutrino. Now, very simply, if a particle is a real particle, a real lepton, if a lepton is a real lepton, then it's given a lepton number of plus one, whereas if it's um, an antiparticle, it's given a minus one. So therefore, this should make obvious sense to you. And because this series we've got here is the um, electron series, these are the neutrinos in question, are electron neutrinos, and hence anti-electron neutrinos, then the lepton number is L, um, um, Le, the electron lepton series. We will also have as well, um, let me talk about, part, let me do this in another color, particles. You, we can also have a muon, of course, an anti muon. We can have a neutrino, muon neutrino, and an anti neutrino of the muon type, anti muon neutrino. And those similarly will have plus one if it's a real particle for the neutri muon neutrino and the, and the muon, and an anti muon minus one and the anti muon neutrino minus one. And again, if we wanted to, or we went up the higher energy levels, we could have a tau, an anti tau, um, a neutrino tau, or even a anti tau neutrino. I've done this one as a symbol, run out a bit of space there. So they all have this similar number um, and that would be given a mu or a tau number if we're trying to conserve those three. Excellent, so why don't we therefore look at an example and see how these, um, see whether we can conserve these things. Let me just leave that in there so you can just see that and get our reaction. So we're looking at a muon turning into an electron Oops, that's an electron, not a positron, plus an anti-electron neutrino, plus a muon neutrino. So let's go with charge first. Is charge conserved? Well, we have minus one charge from the muon neutrino. We have minus one from the electron. We have a chargeless objects, which are neutrinos, and so therefore that conservation law holds true. What about the electron-lepton number? Well, this is a muon, so it doesn't have any electron, lepton-electron number. We have a plus one, not to be confused here with negative charge, but it's a real particle, hence it's plus one. Um, we have a minus lepton, because it's an anti-lepton, the electron anti-electron neutrino. And of course, the muon neutrino is not in the same series as the lep as the a lept electron, so therefore it comes out as zero, and that also holds true. What about a muon lepton number? Well, we do have a muon lepton on this side. We the electron is not part of that series, nor is the new electron neutrino. However, the muon neutrino is part of that series, so we take again. So this reaction can take place. Wonderful. Okay, let's look at another one. Let's take a look at the neutron turning into a proton plus an electron, beta radiation, plus this anti-electron neutrino. 
charge first, no charge on the neutron, one positive charge on the proton, minus charge on the electron, and no charge on the neutrino. Tick, that makes sense. What about the electron lepton? Well, that is a baryon. It doesn't have, a, it's not part of the electron lepton series. The proton is a baryon. The electron is a positive electron lepton, even though it has a negative charge. But the anti neutrino is required to make this make sense. So that is why that was an antiparticle that we've been using in all of the descriptions from the previous um, video to this one. I've put an anti-electron neutrino there because in order for the electron lepton number to conserve. Wonderful, so this looks like it's gonna take place. However, we also need to conserve baryon number. And I should describe what this is, but why don't I just go straight in and then describe it a little bit later. Is a neutron a baryon? Yes, so it's one. Is a proton a baryon? Yes, it is. We'll give it number one. Electron a baryon? No, it's not, because they're leptons, nor is the electron neutrino. So that is also conserved. What about the number of up quarks? So with the up quark, what do we have here with the neutron? We have an up, down, down. The proton is an up, up, down, and the others don't have any quark structure to them. So therefore, how many ups do I have on this side? One. And I have two on that side and nothing from those two. That does not add up. The down quark. I have two on this side. I have one, none, and none. That does not add up, or should I say, does not equal. So what does that mean? Well, the first three mean that reaction does take place. But if the up and the downs are not conserved, then the weak force dominates. And the reason why is because there is what we describe a change in flavor. This quark here, if this highlighter works, that quark there has changed its flavor. Right, so therefore, when we come back here, and we talked about conservation laws, lepton numbers being conserved as well, charge, we also have baryon number. And for the baryon number, B, the particles, And B would be, we have a hadron, an anti-hadron, or a meson. And very simply, if it's a hadron, it has one as a baryon number, because there are three quarks, each with a third and each with a certain charge. It's minus one if it's an anti-hadron. And the mesons are zero, because remember, you have a quark and anti-quark pair, and in effect, they cancel out from each other. It's quite an important one there. Mesons have um, baron numbers of zero. So I think it's best if we try, again, another reaction. And this time, we're going to look at remind myself what we've got. Let's try a pion, sorry, a proton plus a pi minus turning into a neutron and a neutron. Is that possible? If you think you're confident enough with this, then why don't you hit pause and give it a go? Otherwise, let's run through. Charges first. One plus minus one gives us zero plus zero. Well, that works so far. That's wonderful. That's the charge. What about the baryon number? Well, we have one, it is a baryon, a proton. Interestingly, a pi minus is a zero, it's a meson. And that goes to being one and one. Both of those are baryons, that does not work. We have no leptons involved. Um, but if we wanted to, let's just go through the whole process. The proton is an up, up, down, 
and the pi minus is an anti-up down combination. The neutrons are up, down, downs, and we've got two of those. I mean, we already can see that the reaction doesn't work, but let's just go through the rest of the process anyway. We have two ups and one anti-up. And we have two ups on that side, or should I do just for consistency? One plus one, and that doesn't work. And the downs, well, we have one there, we have one on this side, but we've got two, and we've got two, so once again, it doesn't work, so no reaction. Okay. What about our next one? Let's try something else and see how this works. How about we have a proton and a proton turning into a proton and a neutron and a pi plus. You think you know whether you can say whether this reaction takes place and whether the weak force is involved or not. Hit pause and give it a go. Otherwise, here comes the solution. Let's look specifically at what we've got here. We've got up, up, down, up, up, down. We've got an up, up, down, an up, down, down, and an up, anti-down. So charges, one plus one gives us one plus nothing plus one, tick. So far, so good. Baryon numbers, there are no leptons, so we'll just stick with the baryons. It is a baryon, proton, it is a baryon, a proton. It is a baryon, a proton, and a neutron is also a baryon. A meson has a zero number, so that holds true as well. Okay, what about my up numbers? I've got two and two ups on this side. I've got two plus one plus one, bingo, another bit works, and the downs, I've got one plus one, that gives you one plus two minus one, because I've got an anti-down, that works as well. So the reaction takes place. And because these two work, the strong force dominates. Okay, now another one. I'll use some exotic particles here. Let's look at the delta minus going to a neutron plus a pi, a pi plus meson. Remember, this is just a very excited state <coughs> of a triple down. Well, actually, you can't get triple downs, but the deltas are excited states. This is a down, down, down. We've got an up, down, down, and we've got an up, anti, down. Charges first. Let's see what we've got. We have minus one. We have zero. We have a, sorry, pause. <laughs> that should have been an anti Um, that should have been an, sorry, a negative pi meson. So therefore, this does work. Might have given the game away. I'm looking for this to actually take place. Baryon number. I do have a baryon here. I do have a baryon there. And I have a meson, so that's a zero. So that takes place. I can say the reaction takes place. What about up quarks? Well, I have zero up quarks on that side. I have one up quark on that side. And I meant to have minus one up quark on that side because what I forgot to do when I corrected this was I forgot to change that into an anti-up down because now it's negative. So therefore, this is correct. Anti and that is correct. Downs, three on this side. I've got two plus one, that takes place. Wonderful. So these two mean that the strong force dominates. <clears throat> I, there's no change in quark flavor, so therefore we don't have a weak reaction. Right, so <clears throat> with all of those ideas, I mean, I, I hope that it seems quite straightforward as we go from one reaction to the next. It's only adding you know, zeros, ones, twos, threes, minus ones, twos, threes. 
but somewhere along the line you will probably be asked to say whether a weak force has taken place and so therefore let me write here what is the check for does a weak or is weak force involved well the first question is are leptons involved <coughs> And if the answer is yes, then yes. Why? Because they don't feel the strong force. Number two, are neutrinos involved? The answer is yes, then the weak force is involved. And the reason is because they don't feel the electromagnetic force, because they're not charged. Number three, three, do quarks change flavor? Yes, then the weak force is involved. And number four, that we don't talk about this very much, the decay times. If t is greater or equal to 10 to the minus 10 seconds, then weak is involved. And that you might just get asked generally about it rather than actually um, having to explain why that is the case. Okay, good. So hopefully that should give you a sense of conservation laws and you'll be able to predict whether something happens or whether something will not happen in a, in a subatomic uh, reaction. Good, hope that makes sense.